Ms. Feibel. Here. Mr. Klingler. Here. Ms. Lamke. Here. Mr. Markham. Here. Ms. Robinson. Here. Ms. Saad. Here. Mr. Sharp. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one in nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Yes, thank you. So we are delighted to welcome back after a too long hiatus, Mr. Darius Blackford, the president and CEO of the Columbus Marathon. I'm not sure I've made that up. Sorry, Darius, who is here to regale us with our uh, what, what is typically an annual update on uh, the marathon coming through our amazing, awesome city. Thank you. You did promote me. I'm just the race director, but uh, okay. it's still well. still a pretty big job. So, yeah, actually, uh, this is my eleventh time before council. So some of you I've uh, some of you I haven't met or I have met last year. I didn't I didn't come, but uh, eleven out of twelve years. So um, the marathon Columbus Marathon has been coming through Bexley for this will be our forty first year coming through uh, the city. This is uh, the event is on October seventeenth. Uh, which is, uh, this is my first time being here in September. Usually I'm here in October. And basically we have been blessed to um, have a partnership with Nationwide Children's Hospital since 2012. We've raised more than $10 million for the hospital. And uh, in large part because the community of Bexley, Grandview Heights, Upper Arlington allow us to, uh, to, to borrow your streets for a little bit. Bexley has the uh, wonderful distinction, I think, on your behalf that we're out of your neighborhood by about 915 in the morning. So most residents, many residents don't know we come. Uh, but I also, um, uh, we really feel feel honored to uh, have the opportunity to, to come here. Uh, I personally do the door uh, hangers. I did them yesterday on uh, throughout the, the course sections in Bexley. And I, I want to share a story uh, of one of your residents uh, where marathoning and politics uh, collide. So I, uh, I was going up to a door and uh, I, don't, I don't knock. I'm actually, I go in the morning because uh, I, I really don't want anybody to get uh, to bother anyone. And as I'm going to a door, the door opens and a resident of uh, Drexel Avenue, who I'm, I'm not going to share this part, um, says to, opens the door and she says, what is this? And I say, oh, I'm sorry. It's, uh, it's just a flyer with information about the uh, Columbus Marathon. And she looks at me and says, oh, I thought it was about the sewers. <laughs> I fully support the Columbus Marathon. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, so needless to say, uh, I, I got out of there uh, pretty easy. But uh, whoever is in charge of the sewer project uh, may, may need to watch out. So, but no, sir. <laughs> Seriously, um, we're just, we're, we're really honored to have the opportunity to come through uh, Bexley every year. And, and it's just a highlight for the, for the athletes. I mean, you know, you do a wonderful thing. You'll make the leaves change here in just a few weeks. And, uh, you know, it's, um, uh, we'll have great weather. And but uh, in all honesty, just thank you so much. I, I have no, no agenda except just to say uh, thanks and uh, see if anybody has any questions or uh, anything at all that uh, might come up. Yes. Thank you for hanging up all those door hangers for all of us. Thank oh, you. You're welcome. you're welcome. We all know what that's like, yeah. so we appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I, I actually, since you're so good at it, I yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, cool. are, are you? Are is this? Is this year are we doing the mile? Is the mile champions? Is that what's called? Yeah. So, so uh, since we partnered with the hospital and since 2012, we have one of the patients. Uh, every every mile on the course is uh, uh, in honor of one of the patients from, from the hospital. They're not a current patient, but they're they're someone who, who've uh, who've been uh, 
supported and helped by the hospital. So the um, I don't have the list, uh, but there will be two champions, mile four and mile five in Bexley that, um, uh, you know, I mean, the, the, the family comes out and, and it's just, it's a great, it's a great time. Um, so there'll be, I believe one is typically located right at the apron there of Columbus School for Girls. Uh, or in that general area and then uh, the one on uh, the one probably mile five is is not on it may be on main down by kroger uh, a little bit past uh, uh across the across the creek so all right but thank you again if there's anything uh, the mayor knows how to get a hold of me so so thank he'll uh, so keep me posted but thanks everybody really appreciate it thank you. thanks Terrence. Thank you. Well, take care all right now we're to the portion of our uh, for these well-known public comments. Are there any paper slips? Okay. All right, then we will uh, move on to my report. Uh, I will uh, a quick update uh, uh, from the sexual conversion event. Um, we are having um, one of my absolute favorite main events this week, the talent show, where we can come and tell lots of fun kids, do lots of fun things, um, and enjoy uh, some uh, some great talent. And we are uh, we also are uh, having a celebration of um, Senate Heritage Month. We are having Coke we are playing here with the Love and Coco, which is also about a child with talented. And so, uh, and your mom is going to visit with us um, for free. So, um, that's it. Um, I get to go brag about um, Bexley uh, tomorrow at the um, Women's Metropolitan Club. So, I'll be doing that tomorrow, and I'm excited about that. And um, some of us will be participating in the Lisa of the Voters. So, those of you who want to come and attend, attend and here are all the candidates from school board and the auditor and city council um, and um, our great city attorney will be sharing information about um, the charter minister. Uh, that's about all I have to report, so I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, so a couple of things. First of all, it turns out I needed to be out of town at the last minute for work tomorrow, Thursday night. So Jim Wilson will be doing the five minute presentation. He has also spearheaded a pack that is supporting uh, the um, <clears throat> supporting the five issues. Apparently, there's 50 signs they've ordered to be divvied up and some a flyer to pass out. So it's great. Um, give them a lot of credit. The um, other thing I just want to, President of Fiebel asked me, you know, so there have been a bunch of emails going around. And so President Fiebel asked me to speak for a minute about some of these First Amendment issues that have arisen in emails. Um, and so, you know, a, a couple of things, and I know we've had conversations about this more than once, but first of all, um, the, um, <clears throat> again, just so folks know, is that there is no legal obligation for city council or any legislative body to allow for public comment. I'm not saying you shouldn't, I'm just telling you that that is not a legal requirement. Um, but once a, a, a body such as city council decides to allow public comment, you need to be consistent in how it's applied irrespective of the message. So the fact that a particular group believes and maybe rightfully so has a very important message about race in Bexley and wants to be invited as a public as a as a guest as opposed to speaking during public comment if if that is allowed then other groups then for the most part there, there's some exceptions but the, for the most part you will then need to allow other groups who make such a request have equal participation on a whole host of issues because the First Amendment says essentially we can't tell people they can or cannot speak based on the content of their speech. So the fact that one group comes because they have an important message doesn't necessarily mean that that's the only message you're going to be able to hear. And again, that applies in 
and council does this appropriately and applies that standard in its public comments at the beginning and the end of the meeting that folks can talk about anything they want for up to five minutes. Um, but the minute that people are now invited to make a PowerPoint presentation on a particular topic of interest, I shouldn't say of interest, of a political or quasi-political topic um, means that the door is now open for others to do the same. And it's really hard to close that door once it's open. So again, it's been my, I have shared this with you via email, but I'm gonna say it here for the, whoever wants to hear it, to hear it, is that is that it has been my recommendation that in this particular situation, Brer is not the type of group who needs to be invited to a speak as a special guest and put on a PowerPoint presentation, similarly to many other examples I can think of where those groups would not be appropriate um, or necessary to be allowed to come to city council and speak. Again, my concern is that once you do it for one, you got to do it for many, not necessarily all, but for many. So that's in a nutshell, what I've tried to explain via email the past couple of weeks. Uh, Mark, just a point of clarification. You just said not be allowed to speak. I believe that any group can come speak at public comments. The, 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 the only discretion, you're, you're just distinguishing between a special guest yes. versus public comment. Right? Thank you. Let me make that clear. Yeah. Any group can come and speak during public comment, period. And subject to the rule public comment rules and any individual can as well. My point was, if it wasn't clear, I apologize that being coming as a special guest, being allowed to do a PowerPoint presentation and essentially be, being given unlimited time. If, if council chooses to allow a particular group with a particular message, um, then the first amendment is gonna make it hard to close that door to other groups who would be expected to be allowed to come during as a special guest and do their full presentation. And as I've said many times before, um, and I've said a lot this past week, these meetings are business meetings. It, they're not town forums. Now, again, you have, and rightfully so, allowed massive amount, in my experience, of opportunities for public comment um, at the beginning, the end of the meeting, and during ordinances. But again, the, it, my, my biggest concern is that the rules need to be enforced con with a con on a content neutral basis. I probably said way more than I needed to there. Well, we are grateful for that. So thank you so much. Um, Ms. Lamke has a question for you, Mr. Fisher. Mark, I just wanted to ask if you could confirm that uh, the required mailing for the proposed charter amendments went out to uh, registered Bexley voters um, as contemplated for in our charter? I think so, huh, Natalie? Great, and it'll also be published as well. No, actually, I was, I'm glad you brought that up. I was wrong before. The charter says mailed to every elect elector or published. Oh. So Bill caught that. I, I actually caught it before that, but I still was, <laughs> was wrong initially. So I apologize, but it is gonna be, again, it is gonna be uh, in the, in the, uh, the blast, the blast, water bill. And, yeah, we, so. we, not, uh, we felt that, the, that, that uh, sending it to every elector was the safest, best coverage. A lot of people don't get the dispatcher necessarily turn to the section of the dispatch where you would read <laughs> exactly. all the charter language. So uh, it just seemed like a much better way to get notification out. Anybody else have a question for our city attorney? All right, then I'm gonna go ahead and move on to administrative updates. Is Mr. Bayshore around? Hi, Madam President. Um, have my written report, report attached and I do not have anything to add to it tonight. Thanks, Andy. Does anybody else have anything to ask Andy? It looks like um, Ms. Saad has her hand up. Andy, we just talked about it in the budget meeting, but the planters on Livingston look amazing. So thanks for getting those installed. It really adds to that corridor and uh, it's a great feel coming into Bexley with those. Um, also wanted to say congrats on the Vernon project. It's completed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um wanted to just ask really quickly your uh matt was talking about the street lining on drexel i live right off there so i'm on drexel every day four or five times a day um 
I know we had a pretty big repair near, near CSG. I'm assuming we're going to be fixing that street uh, here as soon as we can get to that. I know that there was one area that um, <coughs> received a little bit more um, work. <laughs> <laughs> so um, just running through there and on the golf cart through there, it looks like uh, the community could benefit from getting to that sooner than later with for a little further repair because um, it's a lot of high traffic. Um, and then just wanted to ask you the 300 trees um, that we have going out, where are those going in Bexley? Those are in every uh, section of the city um, spread out. Um, we actually didn't do a tree planting project last year. So that's why we're doing 300. Usually we do 140 to 150 and we were doing 300 this year to make up from for last year, but it's spread out through the whole city. Oh. I did get one of those trees this week <laughs> in front of my house. So thank you. Thanks, Ian. Keep up the great work. Looks like Mr. Yeah. Flink has a question also. Um, yeah, thanks, Andy, for um, all that you guys do. Just a review of the new street sweeper. How's it going? <laughs> the guys are extremely happy. Um, it's been in use pretty much every day since we've had it. Um, it's working really well. Looks really fancy. I love it. While you're on that, I want to thank you, Andy. I was I was driving uh, downtown today, and I noticed our our ramps were very pristine. And I assume that was our sweeper because I didn't see any other evidence of ODOT doing any sweeping. So, <laughs> thank you. That was our sweeper. You're welcome. <laughs> All right, yay to the service guys. Thanks so much, Andy. Take care. Have a good rest. Of All right, moving on to the police department. Chief Reinhardt, are you there? The chief is out of the office oh, today. He is. So I can answer any questions the best of my ability you might have or uh, refer them on for future answers. Anybody for the good mayor stepping into the shoes of the chief? Nope. All right. Michael Price in the Recreation and Parks update. Sorry about that. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I have nothing to add to my written report. Okay, we talked about budget for the rec department, and I'm thinking that Mike Price needs some new chairs in his office. <laughs> oh, he does that on purpose. So, yes, for these meetings, I pull the worst chair I can into the office, just so you guys know. Right. <laughs> Every year at budget season, he pulls that chair. Yeah. Yeah, to, uh, okay. you know, next, next meeting, you might see a hole in the wall behind me as well. So. I'm sorry. I saw that last week and I almost said that last week and I couldn't help myself this week. <laughs> Could you move that chair next time? This I isn't my first budget process. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody have any, any questions or comments for um, Mr. Price? All right, Mike. Hey, have a good week. Take care. You as well. All right, we are to the finance department update and our good auditor, Mr. Harvey. Uh, we see the August report, um, as several of you have alluded to, we have lots of money, it keeps rolling in. We've got another $700,000 that I don't think is even in this budget that we're getting from, uh, from the, whatever they call that newest federal money. Um, but we're looking, we're in, we're in good financial shape. We're going to end up the year with, you know, I would guess at least a million dollars over budget. Um, the tax revenue looks like it's coming in correctly uh, and positively. Um, so keeping our fingers crossed. Happy to answer any questions if anybody has any, but. Any questions for uh, Mr. Harvey? Right. It's called the American Rescue Plan. That's the uh, latest you. round of federal funding. He knew that. He just couldn't remember. <laughs> I like the way he said it. <laughs> it was good. Um, all right. I have uh, sort of a wordy update. I noticed I really? did a very. I <laughs> thanks, Bill. Did a bad job taking pictures this uh, this past couple of weeks. But um, I want to draw your attention. Coming up on the thirteenth at six thirty is our Livingston Avenue work public workshop. Our next public workshop is our second public workshop. It will be occurring actually at the auditorium of Christ the King School. If you guys recall, we had a 
we had a candidates night there or something oh, yeah, four years ago, didn't we? Years ago. Yeah. So it's that, it's that space, um, which we figured was really spacious, would handle, you know, people uh, coming and going and would be a good way to, to hold it on Livingston. So that's where it will be. And at that meeting, you can expect to see some early concepts for short and long-term improvements to Monique's point. Um, so please, please do participate if you get the chance um, to do so. Also, uh, our trick or treat is on the 28th of October. Um, so that's Thursday evening, the same as other local communities. Just something to keep in mind. Um, you know, it was difficult to sit through the, the, the meeting earlier and, and hear all the talk about the senior center because I wanted to announce this evening that we did receive a grant from the Bexley Community Foundation to provide Wait, hold on, wait for it. Provide, uh, I believe it's $40,000 for furnishing a interim uh, space here at the former Art with Anna for the next couple of years at 420 North Cassidy for a senior slash uh, youth center. So yay, now we can clap. Yay, Community Foundation. So um, th this is the letter of intent. Uh, where we're asking for it, but you know, it's it's interesting. Uh, although the concept is still under development, we said the concepts to create a usable space for senior citizens with occasional intentionally programmed use by other segments of the population, including middle school and high school age children. So our rec department is 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 jamming on this, and we are all buzzed to see what we can do uh, to take the space. What we're viewing this as, um, with uh, you know, with with sincerity, because we understand once we open up an idea like this, we can't really walk back from it too easily, right? So we understand that this is a commitment of sorts. But what we're reviewing this as is essentially our fees, if, if a component of a feasibility study. So we have about a 2000 square foot space. Um, it's, uh, it's roughly the size of what we had pictured we would be building out over at the Historical Society Cottage when we first started talking about this. So in, in experiencing a space like this with little cost, and by the way, the community foundation money will be used for everything that will be put in there will be able to be put in some other space. It's not going to be uh, fixtures that are permanent to that space. So it's going to be furniture, it's going to be equipment, it's going to be things that can be adapted into another space. Um, but the idea is we'll, we'll get a feel for is this, you know, it's just like when you move into your house for the first time, all of a sudden you realize, oh, I didn't realize I didn't realize that until I moved in. So is the space a good size? What what it would, would be missing? And so it'll really provide really invaluable information about how that might work. You know, if it's the right size, if it's if it's being used as much as it could be used. And so um, I know that our senior coordinator is active right now and and helping steer this. And um, and we've been having lots of great meetings thinking about it. So thank you to the community foundation for funding that. Um, we think we're going to be able to do this with our existing feasibility funding, but we'll know more as we get into the budget process. And I hear everything you guys all said. So good news is I, I just thought you might mention that. So I started working on it a couple of weeks ago before, uh, before that meeting. Um, this is the letter that is going out to all of our residents signed by your, your own William Harvey with the, all the charter language. So that, that will go out in time for our deadline is technically October 1st or 2nd, but this will go out uh, in, before that. So can I just clarify again, Ben said what I've said a million times, residents, it's actually just, just for clarification, it's going to Electors. all the folks who voted in the last, in last year's election as reported by the board of elections. So some households might get two. Right. Last last municipal election is it? Or last, last general election? The last the 2020 election. Right, last right. year. Which was last year. <laughs> Time flies. It's um, 21. The, uh, it's either the last year's election or the one in 2020. Can we all just get along? But anyway, the um the so some households might get two and some might get none if they didn't vote last time or whatever. Right. Just FYI. Um Speaking of which, totally kind of unrelated, but uh, we just got certification from the Ohio Secretary of State. Good news, we are still a city based upon the census. Thank you, yep. All right, it's good. But we're, our population is 13,900 and something as of the census. So we are really edging up to that 14,000 number that I've been telling people for years is what we actually are at. So this is good. more, right, than we were. Um, we are going to be sending out a... Uh, so the board of control me met last week about our electric electrical aggregation 
And we decided that our next step would be to send out a survey to the community to just gauge the interest given some of the dynamics we've been talking about. So that survey, we are rushing to get it into our water bill, our water bill um, so that we can get uh, mail, mail back responses from people. We think that'll help us reach people that wouldn't necessarily be on the blast. Um, and I'm going to skip real quickly to that. So I think we're going to, you know, we'll start to see them in the next couple of weeks. We're also going to send them electronically in the blast. We're going to have separate results from our paper <coughs> ballot or survey and, and from our electronic survey just to see what that looks like. Uh, speaking of which, paperless billing is coming to our water bill. Uh, I believe that system is ready for this current water bill that's about to come out. Um, so people will be able to, residents will be able to opt out of receiving a paper bill. And I want to give credit to the auditor who has been dogged in his determination to pursue that. So thank you for pushing that project along. He's been working with our water department and our IT manager. Um, in conjunction with that change, counterintuitively, uh, we will be now distributing our newsletter separately from the water bill. And the reason we decided to do that is we consistently hear communication from people that say, we never know what's going on in the city. And, and it doesn't quite make sense because, you know, every water bill has the, those key pieces of information. And the next thing we hear is, oh, the water bill, I, I like pay it and throw it away. So they don't look at it. So we think this is a good time for us to separate the newsletter from the water bill. It's going to, it's going to go out in a, form that's sort of similar to what the library sends out with their programming uh, material. We'd already moved to that kind of fold out newsletter the past couple of times, if you guys seen that, um, to try to get more information and have it easier to read. So we'll be using that new form, um, but separately mailed. Uh, and that will mail to apartment residential addresses as well, which our water bill does not. So that's a, another advantage of that. Um, Project Taillight, I think I've mentioned to you guys, we've, we have been pursuing Columbus to see if we could join in on their Project Taillight initiative. Their initiative in theory is where a, if somebody was pulled over with an equipment violation, um, an officer could refer them to a free resources, in, income dependent, potentially free resource to help repair that issue. Um, looking at our equipment violations, 90% of equipment violations are warnings, not citations in Bexley. Often those citations are coupled with something else that's going on. Um, but we, in talking to Columbus, they have not gotten to the point where they're doing officer referrals. They're doing, they're, they're doing like open workshops with the community, but they're not doing something where somebody gets pulled over and they can get referred on to. So they think it's going to be a while before they're there. So we're working on developing our own program. And that's something that you can expect to see uh, in the budget as well next year. And I just wanted to give you guys that update. And Monique has her hand raised. Will there also be maybe referrals from mayor's court, whether it's the magistrate or prosecutor, public defender, so that people who actually do get cited for that are aware of what Project Tail Light could, could do to help them? Absolutely. I mean, and in theory, they would have already received that information at the time of the, of the interaction. Because I, I would primarily like it to be leave that officer interaction with a positive, you know, follow-up. But yeah, that's that's something that certainly we'll make sure mayor's court's aware of. Um, and finally, uh, youth interaction working group update. We are, we're full of surveys right now. We're, we'll also be sending a survey that the group has created uh, via the blast, via our newsletter and mailing surveys to residential apartment units. Um, so that'll, help uh, us index police interaction and inform the working groups process. And that is my update and open to any questions. Any further questions for Mr. Mayor? All right, Thank and you. with your permission council, I'm gonna move on to the consent agenda, Mr. City Attorney. All right, we have three items on the consent agenda. Agenda, September 14th, 2021 city council meeting minutes. Ordinance 35-21 to enter into an agreement with ODOT for urban paving project along US 40, including resurfacing and partial pavement repair, along with other associated work in accordance with preliminary participatory legislation, RC 5521.01, introduced by Mr. Markham, and resolution 11-21, confirming the mayor's appointment of Rachel Lang to the Civil Service Commission that was introduced by Ms. Lamke. All right, thank you. Yeah. Are there any questions um, or concerns from council about the consent agenda? Any comments or concerns 
from those who are joining us this evening. Can I have a motion on consent agenda, please? Motion to pass consent agenda. Thank you, Mr. Klingler. Second. 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 Thank you, Ms. Robinson. Um, Ms. Robinson. Yes. Ms. Saad. Yes. Ms. Feibel. Yes. Mr. Klingler. Yes. Ms. Lamke. Yes. Mr. Markham. Yes. Thank you. We do have an we do have one uh, ordinance um, with the visiting presenter, um, Mr. Uh, City Attorney. Okay, so this is the second reading of Ordinance 39-21 to amend the bed and breakfast at 519 South Drexel Avenue in the city of Bexley, Ohio. That was introduced by Ms. Saad. Yes, so um, as we, we had our first reading at the last meeting and um, we were read the ordinance here with the bed and breakfast um, at 519 South Drexel and the consideration of Capital University entering into the contract to purchase the bed and breakfast. Um, so if there are not further questions on this currently, I would love to ask that our presenter from Capital, who's here tonight, um, come and speak on the ordinance. We can hear from them. And it looks like Mike uh, and Leslie uh, are here in the audience too, who currently are the owners of the bed and Bexley bed and breakfast. So thanks for coming tonight. Great. Well, thank you, uh, Ms. Mayor, council members. Thank you for having me. I'm Bill May. I'm the vice president for business and finance at Capital. Uh, we were presented with this opportunity. Sheila Straub gave me an email and said, hey, I think there's a great thing you can do. Uh, this would be a great addition to Capital University. And we agreed. Uh, Dave Kaufman, our president, and I talked about it. We went and toured the property. It is beautiful, as most people know. And we thought it'd be a great addition on tour. You know, we have been obviously community members for you know our life, basically. And we thought this is an additional opportunity to involve ourselves in the community, quite frankly. It's it's a well-established, well-respected business, and we would like to you know, be part of it as they're moving on. Uh, we would like to take that over. Uh, we, as the ordinance uh, we worked with the mayor and council on was, we would have uh, a full-time employee living in there, running it. Um, we would not be housing students there. We would be running it exactly as it is today. It would be for visitors to the city, visitors to capital, visitors to the Columbus area, whoever we can get to be there. We would run it exactly the, the way it is right now. Uh, we would, and actually our students have uh, developed previously a marketing plan uh, for, for them. Uh, and we would like to continue involving our students in the understanding of the business. Again, we would have the employee running it, but we would like to have them understand what it takes to run uh, effectively a, like a small business, uh, participate in it. We would like them to help run the, the website for it, help do the marketing work associated with it it would be an opportunity to you know, put themselves around a, a small business and see how it is. Um, and you know, again, it would be, we think it's just a perfect opportunity for us to be involved. Our organizational sustainability committee meeting met, uh, met today, they approved it. It goes to the board of trustees to be approved uh, tomorrow. So at this point, we would like to continue moving forward. We would obviously uh, in talking to the mayor, we would need this ordinance passed to allow for that, certainly. Uh, and we would ask for your approval. Thank you. Council, does anyone have any questions? Um, I just had a quick question sure. regarding capital and the programs that you offer when you're, um, I love that you're gonna engage students into the bed and breakfast concept and let them run this business model. Do you have a hotel management program at Capital? We do not. Okay. No. Now, in fact, um, Columbus State has, mm -hmm. you know, a hospitality type program. We thought that would be a per an area that we could reach out to, too. And one of the things I want to do, too, is continue the relationships uh, that Mike and Leslie have done within the community here. Mm -hmm. So if there's a group that they're sourcing the food from in the morning, we'd like to continue with that and, and is keep those relationships moving and, and such. So, uh, no, we don't have that program, but we do have a school of management and leadership, and that would probably be the group that would most likely be, the, be involved. And our students are all, you know, I think even some of our students help without some of the housekeeping right now, too. There you go. Thank you. Sure. I love that you're trying to keep it um, the way the current owners 
did it. Their their hearts and souls, I know, went into creating that, and it will forever to me be theirs, even though it is going <laughs> to potentially be capitals. I look at it and I think of how hard they worked on it. So there's no reason to fix something that ain't broke. <laughs> I like to hear that. Council, anything else for? Nope. Great. Thank well, thank you, you so much for great. sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you, we Bill. really appreciate it. All right. Council, anybody have anything else to add? All right. With your permission, we'll move on to third readings. Okay, we have a third reading of Ordinance 36-21 to establish the American, the American Rescue Plan Act Fund and to appropriate $1,442,422.10 in from the ARPA Fund. Mr. Markham. Yes, as Mr. Harvey had mentioned previously, this is uh, the money distributed to us from that uh, American Rescue Plan Act uh, and uh, just establishes the uh, fund for our city deposit that money in and then of course uh in the coming months year we'll be uh talking about how we want to uh utilize that money all right does anybody have yes question please miss lamke my, my question is actually for for bill bill can you remind us generally of what the timeline might be that we would receive these funds and any other cares act money that we might uh, have on the horizon we, we have already received half of this, 700 and some thousand. We expect to receive, and we might have actually even received the other part, but in the next, you know, weeks, not months, we'll get the rest. And what we have not yet received is a lot of guidance on what that can be used for, but we anticipate that pretty soon, unless you've seen something else. I mean, they've... I, they have fairly, it's broad. Right, right, right. That's fair to say. Uh, and there's, there does seem to be pretty decent guidance coming out at this point. But uh, it's, you know, it's it's what everything CARES Act covered plus infrastructure needs, specifically sewer and water infrastructure needs, not, not paving. Paving is not mentioned and broadband. So currently that money's sitting in Bill Harvey's personal account. We need to get this yep. uh, actually, fund set up. Actually, with, with the $540 million in the lottery tomorrow night, I've already oh. invested a little bit of that in that lottery fund. Oh, good. So I hope to have good news for you at our next meeting. <laughs> Let us uh, know. Are there any questions or comments from council before I ask Mr. Markham to, if he's ready to make a motion on this? Any comments or questions from uh, those of us joining us? Mr. Markham? At uh, this time I move that we adopt ordinance 36-21. There's a first, is there a second? Second. There's a second from Mr. Klingler. Is there a uh, city auditor? Ms. Feibel? Yes. Ms. Saad? Yes. Mr. Markham? Yes. Ms. Lamke? Yes. Mr. Klingler? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Passes. All right, if we could, let's move on to second readings. All right, so we have a second reading of Ordinance 3721, accepting the donation of a recreation easement consisting of two sites, 0.981 acres and 1.471 acres respectively, adjacent to and west of Sheridan Avenue to the city of Bexley, Mr. Klingler. Thanks, Mark. This is the second reading um, of this ordinance. Um, I don't. I don't think I need to read it again. Does anyone have any questions regarding this? Ms. Fowder, are there any um, any public comment slips um, for any of the rest of the ordinances? No. Okay. I just was making sure so that I don't have to continue that. You know, to keep asking. Um, any questions on um, Ordinance 3721? All right, moving on, please. It, is this a possibility for consent agenda? Uh, I don't object to it being on consent agenda, just Mr. Klingler. Yes. yes, yes, please. Okay, we add that to consent agenda. Usually Bill Harvey's on that, but no, I got gotcha. you. 
Okay, second reading of resolution 1221 to accept tax amounts and rates as determined by the budget commission and authorizing the necessary tax levies and certifying them to the county auditor, Mr. Markham. This is probably a good consent agenda item as well. Um, any questions about this? This is our standard uh, tax amounts and rates. These are given to us and we uh, certify them. Questions? Everybody okay with this being on the consent agenda? All right. Resolution 1321, please. All right. Oops. Okay. Resol second reading of resolution 1321 to adopt the 2021 recommendations of the Bexley Tax Incentive Review Council regarding tax abated properties in the city of Bexley. Mr. Markham. So we talked about this last time. Uh, and now we have Mr. Kessler has thoughtfully attached the uh, extra information and hopefully you may have had a chance to look over these. If not, um, you will probably want to do that before we vote on it. Any questions about these properties, their uses, the decision making process that goes into All right, no questions. Is it okay if we move on? Ordinance 3821, please. All right, second reading. Sorry. Again, second reading of Ordinance 38-21 to amend chapter 13, 1230, I'm sorry, to amend chapter 1230.42, impervious cover definition and chapter 1230.49 lot coverage overall definition in order to specify the treatment of article, artificial turf as impervious cover for purposes of lot coverage calculations. Ms. Saad. Thank you, Mr. Fischel. So this basically just helps define um, artificial turf as an impervious condition. And then it also gives, um, then it applies that you would have a, only a certain amount of artificial turf via the coverage calculations. So we're defining artificial turf as impervious, and we are keeping uh, our residential space from having artificial turf everywhere. all over, where. <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> Although Adam Saad and Troy Markham may want that green space for their golfing, <laughs> okay. but um, this helps define and also um, put coverage calculations in place. That's what this ordinance does. Thank Any you, questions, council? Matt? Just the um, statement, it's, artificial turf is presumed to be impervious cover unless otherwise proven by engineering specifications to satisfy the runoff coefficient requirement above. Is that meant to say that if I hire an engineering firm that proves otherwise, I can bring that to our building department and it could be granted as a variance or right there, bold, it says unless otherwise proven. So... So um, it wouldn't be a variance. It would, it, it would be administered through our building department. So if the uh, installer is able to prove that the artificial turf meets the runoff specifications, then it would not be viewed as impervious cover. However, <laughs> and that's a good question because I think we need to tease this out a little bit more. However, uh, it does say impervious cover surfaces, including artificial turf, uh, are part of lot coverage overall. So, and I have to refresh my memory because I, uh, I wasn't in the zone just now on this, but when we did this, I think there are other applications of impervious cover in our code. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think you get out of having artificial turf be part of lot coverage, no matter what. But I think there are situations where having artificial turf not be called impervious cover uh, can be helpful for you. And I can dig a little deeper into that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Couldn't you just say including applicable artificial turf or so designated yeah. artificial, such designated artificial turf? Well, I think the intent was uh, as drafted and mm -hmm. council can modify this intent for sure. I think the intent was that artificial turf does not perform the same way as organic, you know, plant plants. So um, 
even if it does have decent runoff characteristics, it's still not absorbing, you know, it's still not helping with the stormwater issue. So that's the argument behind it, including it regardless. But what this is opening the door to is if someone has the resources and the, and the will, they could possibly include an artificial turf that still does not create that sort of stressful uh, runoff uh, situation as long as they could prove it to. Uh... That's true for impervious cover. Yeah. Um, that wouldn't, still wouldn't be a plant material. Yeah. Right. I like plants. I'm just saying. But, yeah. but isn't what is more likely to happen that nobody's going to hire an engineer, somebody's going to develop something that is more. Go. Right. Impervious is less impervious. part of their specification. Yep. Right. And, and that'll be a part of the spec when you buy that yeah. stuff. Mm -hmm. So, oh, I'm sorry. So this leaves it open. Right. It would be like yeah. mulch or some other other cover that's not impervious. You can create versions of that. I'm on a lot of turf, different grades of turf for different athletics. And it is constantly, there's investments in improving it. But I think that this ordinance currently with the language leaves it open to exactly what you just said. That so, is, as improvements are made, <laughs> improved. Mr. Fischel is dying to say something. No, I, I just thought you were done, <laughs> yeah. and there was a more a, a pause, and oh. I didn't mean to interrupt. But I do have I do have want to follow up on this because I want to make sure that we're talking through it and understanding it, or that I'm understanding it at least. So under twelve thirty point forty nine, basically. Yeah. 1230.49 is, is listing out, and this is a question, not a statement. Uh, is it intended to list out what is lot coverage? I mean, I, what, what, what is the purpose of 1230.49? So the purpose of that is to, I think, limit the amount of artificial turf that would be on a property. So, but, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Essentially, it includes artificial turf, regardless of whether or not it meets the engineering specs. For the stormwater design manual as a lot coverage as part of the lot coverage uh, calculation so there's a limit to how much lot coverage you can have from um, all of these things combined including artificial turf so the intent is that even if somebody goes gets that engineering spe specification to prove that it, it has, satisfies the runoff coefficient requirement it's still is included, at, it's still included as all impervious surfaces under 1230.49, is that the intention? That was the intent. Cause I think otherwise we'd have to say including artificial turf. Um, other than that, that qualifies under 12. Yeah, other than less. that, right, exactly. Right, but so then what's the purpose or what's the benefit to a homeowner of going to the trouble of, and again, they probably, most people won't, but what's the purpose of going to the trouble of getting engineering specifications to satisfy sure. the runoff coefficient requirement. So there are other areas of our code that where impervious cover comes to play. One of them is our riparian setback along Alum Creek, um, where you have to you have to limit the amount of impervious material that you have. So you there are some okay. very niche applications where having that language and impervious cover would make sense and has nothing to do with lot coverage ratio. Okay, that's what I wanted to make sure. Yeah. So it's this language has specific meaning so people don't view it as I, contradictory. In fact, I have a real life example of that if I, if I may entertain you. So there is a putting green right next to the creek uh, in a, at a residential home in Bexley within our riparian setback. If that individual wished to install, it might be artificial turf, I have no idea, wish to install install artificial turf in lieu of grass, they would have to, it would have to be uh, not impervious cover in that instance. And then this definition would come to play regardless of lot coverage. But, the, but even if it, even if it was engineered to not be impervious, 1230.49 would come into play in terms of that lot, the ratio. For the that, ratio. Yeah. Okay. But let's say they have ample amount. You yeah. Know, they could totally do it with a lot coverage ratio, but then perviousness matters. Okay, so this is really doing two very different things, really, with the artificial turf. I don't mean to say very by making that seem, but it is. Those are two really distinct things. Well, I thought there's a third thing it does, which is the front yard. Yes, right. Section three. Yes. 
And what, I'm sorry, what, how does that read again? That reads that no artificial, no matter what. Yep. Okay. Other questions on turf? Where do noxious weeds fit in? Oh, never mind. Ah. <laughs> Ask Troy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Artificial but noxious weeds. If it's okay with everyone, we'll move on to uh, our first reading, <laughs> Ordinance 4021, please. All right. First reading of Ordinance 40 21 to specify overtime pay provisions for city employees who work community events, events on July 4th, 2021, September 5th, 2021. Mr. Markham. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I want you to uh, go ahead and describe the circumstances that lead us to introduce this ordinance. So we had um, an exceptional need for employees, both at our 4th of July and at our Labor Day block party event, just due to um, the, for the 4th of July, we had a lot of extra safety considerations. And then for the Labor Day block party event, um, it was just a lot more set up than typical. And, and it required, because of the nature of our staffing and where it is today, it required the use of staff that is overtime exempt otherwise. So essentially they were in uh, those dates and not getting compensated for those dates. So uh, while some of those employees sometimes do that from time to time, this required a lot more of a all hands on deck situation. And uh, we felt it appropriate to provide for uh, those employees the ability to uh, gain overtime from that, 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 those, those two events. And then with the Labor Day block party, uh, you'll notice it says double time for hours worked. Um, both of these are real killjoys. They don't apply to me. That's, they didn't apply to me no matter what. But uh, anyway, um, the uh, double time is, is Labor Day block party was on the Sunday. Uh, it wasn't technically on Labor Day itself, but you know it's Labor Day weekend. Um, that particular event also, many employers were working past midnight while they are eligible for double time for those sections after midnight, we just felt like it was appropriate to provide double time for the Sunday work. And then there were people that came back on Monday as well. I mean, yeah. That's all. <laughs> Talk to them. That is true. <laughs> Jen? Um, do we have an idea about what the cost will be? That's a fantastic question. Thanks. Um, I will get that for you. That would be yeah. awesome. Yeah. I have it somewhere, but it's not at my fingertips. Is Lansing? Yeah, we know. Yeah, I, know, I just didn't want to. It's, it is not a significant amount. Is that what you said? Right. Yeah. Okay. Is Lamke question? Um, Marker or Ben, the 26202C3B, is that Ohio Revised Code or is that a Bexley statute Bexley. which give us the applicable rates? Do you know what that is? Well, 262.0, two yes. whatever that you just read. It's double time. It's, it's Bexley. Yeah, and it just means that it's July fourth, so they're paid double time. It's it's they're saying overtime worked on a holiday in that section, which normally apply, which does apply to the non-exempt employees, employees who are subject to the Fair Labor Standards Act. So this is just including them. My my second question is, depending on what the monetary total is, if we pass this, um, do we want to keep in mind as to whether would it actually be cheaper to add? a regular part-time or full-time staff to parks and rec and other departments rather than paying overtime to current existing employees if we think the need's going to continue it's a great question I, I i don't so in the instance of the fourth of july like any one given employee added to our roles wouldn't have helped that much we needed 12 employees to to man to person sorry the, the gates um which they did quite competently and it was very it was critical to what we did so i also think it was unusual i don't hopefully we do not have the gate control that we had at fourth of july this year in the future so that was an unusual condition um it's probably immaterial this is cares act eligible expense but nonetheless i think it's important we're smart with our dollars and we're conscientious of them but to answer your question having another employee would not really have made a meaningful difference would have ended up costing us a lot more money elsewhere if we didn't otherwise need them and the cost is not, I mean, again, whatever you get, yeah. the number is, is not going to be close to even a part-time employee salary. And, and just so council knows, we tried really hard 
to get volunteers to fill those positions. And P.S. Nobody wanted to be away from their families on the 4th of July. And so guess what? These people were, a lot of them were away from their families in the morning for the 4th of July doing the race. And then they were away from their families again in the evening. So, I mean, I tried really hard to get volunteers. I personally had a sign up genius out and it just didn't. And, and didn't beyond happen. that, I think what we found is we really started thinking through it is that like some of what we we're asking people to do was a little bit more required some training yeah. and authority. We ultimately ended up using, for example, private security for the perimeter. And we used um, our own employees for the gates just because we knew and, that. And there's a physical aspect too, in addition yeah. to the training. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's more than just sit down and check off something with a pencil. You needed some people who were qualified to do the work. Right. But we'll get you the costs. So we have a dollar figure associated with this. That's a very fair and predictable point. <laughs> Should have had it in hand. My apologies. Mr. Markham? Do you anticipate, though, that we would need to do something, have some sort of provision for Labor Day next year and future Labor Day as well, then? Would this be an ongoing need, right? Um, it's something I like to talk to Mike about. Okay. And just think through that a little bit more. Any um, further questions about this one? Matt? I just wanted to thank the mayor for exempting himself from this. Thank you. But the charter yeah, exempts me already. I was just making sure. Section one, section two. Super clear. Because I, I would made so much overtime for those two days. So. <laughs> I assume city council members who work the Labor Day. Yeah, you guys get over time. Get double time day, for that. So. <laughs> you get double time for sure. Yeah. <laughs> we all would have just banked some overtime. I was there from one to 10. Plus. <laughs> all good. Uh, everybody okay to move forward? Yeah. I do. I want a presentation. We'll give you two. Ordinance 4121, please. Ordinance 40, second, first reading of Ordinance 4121, accepting the proposed donation of the Columbia Place private street in the Columbia Place subdivision by the city of Bexley for a public street. Ms. Saad. Thank you, Mr. Fischel. So um, we go ahead and pull up the ordinance. Was, this is basically um, to kind of summarize this Columbia Place. I'm sure everybody here on council is familiar with that unique area right behind City Hall, right off Bryden Extension. And uh, those streets are private. They were zoned that way. I'm curious to know what year, do we know, Ben? 70s. 70s. Someone said the 30s, I said, no, I think it was 70s or maybe 80s, right? Because So um, private uh, streets that they are looking to donate now to the city of Bexley, which may, would make it public streets. And us as council, basically what that means is um, the legislation before us, we can accept the donation with the deed, uh, which is laid out here as well. Um, people can give government land, um, but government has to accept it. So that is what council will uh, make the decision on. We get to decide what we own and what we do not. So this is just a great reminder of the small um, example here tonight of what this means with it being private at one time in the 70s, and now they're donating it, and it would be public. So um, I think this is laid out pretty nicely. Catherine uh, Cunningham, our zoning attorney, laid out the plot and the replot. And we're looking at some of that right now. Um, and then the auditor's map of Columbia Place. Is that what we're looking at right now? Yes, is on here. So um, with that, I would just leave it up to council who may have questions on this um, donation. So when it's donated, we are then responsible for it, mm -hmm. which means we, although I believe we've been plowing the streets anyway, correct? We have over time. I know as I was service director, sometimes we did sometimes. Okay. We did. Right. Well, it would require that we're now responsible for the um, sewers. We're also responsible now for the street maintenance, and we're now responsible for leave collection, I would assume. And sidewalks. And sidewalks. No, so, I, I don't know that there are sidewalks there. there. Yeah, and actually, can I do a little history, like a little, Absolutely. Yeah, a little background on yep. this? So yep. a few years ago, a coalition of residents on Columbia Place approached me um, and our service director at the time about 
Columbia Place, um, they were surprised to learn that it's a it's a privately held street. They were not aware of that. Um, now that's on them. Bill and I just talked about this recently. They're uh, apparently every single one of the homeowners on that street had a terrible title agent. I'm not sure how that happened, but uh, they all were part party to a essentially a, home, a, a defunct homeowners association that was not meeting. And they, they learned about it when they uh, tax assessment on a piece of property was not being paid. And the Franklin County auditor tried to foreclose on the, the HOA. And I'm, I'm, I, I might, some of my terms might not be quite right, but essentially that's, that's kind of what happened. So uh, residents approached uh, us with uh, a request that the city take over the maintenance of Columbia Place. Now, over the years, like Bill said, we've had questions from residents saying, why aren't you plowing our streets? And we've had to say, well, it's your street to plow. You have to figure that out. And again, they had no HOA, so they had no way to figure that out. So we have helped plow their streets. We have done leaf pickup from time to time. Um, and the residents asked a question, which was, I think, a fair one, which is we're paying the same street levy as everybody else. Why are we not having our streets maintained? And I said to them, I, I, for one thing, I knew there was no street levy back in the 70s whenever this was part of the PUD. And I felt that it was worth asking council the question of whether or not uh, the city would be willing to take ownership of the private street. As I've thought through this over the years, because by the way, this is three or four years ago was the first contact. And then we've asked them to survey the lines, to check the condition of the water and sewer so that we knew what that was. We've done a lot of assessment of it ourselves internally just to understand what the condition of the infrastructure is. And uh, just to satisfy that there wasn't some sort of disaster just waiting to happen when we took, if, if we took over uh, ownership of, of the improvements. Um, I lost my train of thought, was it? what was I saying? So, so uh, the, one, of, one of the questions was, what was I saying before I talked about assessing the property? Yeah, there were a lot of assessments. Assessments, and then what we were already <laughs> taking care of. The tax. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So back then there were no tax levies, uh, and and sorry, as we thought through it, we thought, well, how is this different from what's going to stop Sessions Village from coming and asking for the same thing, or Lions Gate or Bishop Square, some other PUDs that we have located throughout the city. The one that's most analogous is Jeffrey Place, which is the private street off of uh, Parkview, and the difference is um, those locations value and want to preserve the privacy of their street and they want to say we're a private street stay out columbia place residents are willing to have this be an open street that is integrated with the rest of our street grid it really kind of is already but um it says private street i think on it that sign would come down that's really the only thing there it's different whereas Lionsgate sessions those other gated communities they want to preserve and they want to control entirely that infrastructure so they're willing to give that up. Um, and I feel that it's a worthwhile discussion because of the fact that they are paying explicit taxes towards the, the maintenance of streets. Now, it's true that they're paying the maintenance of Main Street and other streets they drive on to get to their, their house. I get that. Um, I, would, I would think, to, in, my, in my opinion, this is a fair request. Um, but I think ultimately you guys need to make the decision. Uh, I do owe you, before you ask, a uh, cost estimate of what it would cost to pave the street, to replace all the sidewalks, to do work on the water and sewers. And what we'll do is we'll do a life, uh, age life estimate where we basically say, um, you know, sewer will last so long, here's what it would cost us, here's our annual takedown of that. And then I'll, we can compare that with what they're paying with if you want street street levy money, for example, sewer capital fees, which also they're paying, and I uh, get you that. But I'm I, I have requested that engineer's estimate, and I do not have it yet. So we will have that for you, Mr. Auditor, and then Mr. Markham. Ben is the city and the schools will evidently give up some tax revenue because this will this is now private property it will become public property. The street itself, the street itself, and whatever is associated. With that right i mean if it's private they gotta be paying somebody's gotta be paying taxes on them right it depends how the auditor looks at it i have to check that out and i have no idea what yep. how if that's significant or not but we gotta keep that in mind as we think through the cost factor well they would still be paying taxes on their 
individual property. I know, but not the street. Not the street. If, the, if the street is, we don't know, right? Right. That's, yeah, yeah. Mr. Marco, can you pull back a little bit? I, I'm just having a hard time figuring out where this is and what what this it's right is. Over here. It's the, so this is us, all that solar right there. Yeah. Right here. And we're how, hanging out here. And how <laughs> how we, how long is this? Panels. How long is this stretch of street? I've never been on this Not. street. It's like five houses. It's a cul de sac. Yeah. There's a gate from our porch over here that goes right to the gate there. So this is Bryden right here, short what we call short Bryden. Yeah. And you can see where it says private drive into Columbia Place. Um, Columbia Place does have sidewalks on both sides. It has an un it has a couple unusual features that are different than our other streets. It has uh, a different curb structure. It's kind of a it's kind of a, what it's called a mountable curb. So it's a curb gutter combo. Uh, it's not as high profile as our curbs. You see them parking on the sidewalks. They have been warned that they will have to comply with Bexley law as it pertains to parking. So that might you know that might cause some irk, some ire with some of them. It's just a call to say. Well, they say it's not a public street. People drive down there if they want to, but nobody got a reason to unless you live. Theoretically, they could say it's joining the, the grid here, but really nobody but the residents would ever right. go down there. So right. it's not they, really. Yeah. And, and, and so I, are you saying that like all this time when something, when they have a pothole on that street, that they have hired private contractors to come in and do that work? Um, in theory, I, but Bill might I, tell you. I will tell you as service director, when I was service director, there were times I had problems and they called us and said, can we work something out? And we'd say, fine, if it was a minor thing, we'd take care of it and say, here's a bill for you know a couple hundred bucks or something. But, and, and as I've mentioned to the mayor, my only real concern is if there's a significant problem there, that we the city doesn't get stuck with it. Ben's assessment that he's requested will give us an idea of, you know, these streets should last for another 15 years or whatever. Yeah. And, go away. and it, 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 one more factor I think to keep in mind is that Sessions Village successfully petitioned council to take over the water sewer infrastructure in Sessions. 10 years ago or so, I think, yeah, maybe less. Right. Um, so there has been some precedent created with just water sewer. But Remember, sessions, there's only six six cars drive on this every day. Right. It's not like it's not like you have big trucks driving. Right. Right. That's a that's right. a that's a 40-year that's right. road. That's right. And sessions said, um, you know, we don't want you to touch our streets <laughs> and you know we want to control all that which is different i mean it is a closed off uh, so they've got a big gate in front of theirs this yeah. is just right. yeah so right in extension of the mariners young families there they use that Troy to go back and bike around as you're down and learning how to ride bike. well they these residents should charge them for that <laughs> right now an option so uh you have what, a question I think Mr. Klingler had a question. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was just curious how this water and sewer worked for these five homes. How how is it? Do they pay it? They pay the water. They've paid their water bill. Yes. To us? yes. So they pay the water bill to us, and they pay the water sewer capital fee. They come. They they're serviced by our our storm sanitary and water lines that come from Brighton over to Columbia Place. But if there's a break within their infrastructure, they are in charge of repairing it today so that's different yeah. from most conditions yeah and i think that's when they started to kind of like freak out as i thought about that now we did assess it so we looked at the water sewer uh determined to be in good condition there is uh 10 or fifteen thousand dollars worth of concrete work that we have i believe asked them to perform before we took it over but I, it's been a while since since we talked about it to them last so i'm not sure if that's do you hear that as well well, the good news is we are going to have someone come in and speak more well, about go. this at our second reading. Yeah. So we will hear more. That is exciting. It'll either be <laughs> <laughs> Bill. Sure Bill, settle down. Um, <laughs> hmm. Bill's super excited. So it'll either be Bob B. Hall, and if he cannot make it, I was uh, told it'll be someone else. All right. Mr. Markham. 
So, so the reasoning behind this, though, just to be clear, is this is what we are sort of saying, well, this, this seems sort of like a fair thing to do for these residents. This is no, there's no benefit to the city to, to taking this over. There's just cost, really. Uh, there's, there's an intangible small benefit. I say it slightly tongue in cheek, but we spend a lot of time every year listening to residents on Columbia Place complain <laughs> about the fact that we don't take care of their property <laughs> and they're paying taxes. So, I mean, I don't, I don't, it's, it would be nice to settle the question one way or the other. How about that? So the benefit of reading an ordinance it, it exists. I agree that there is no legal reason that we, we are not compelled to take this property and there is a financial cost associated with taking this property. And so then I think you think about what is the right thing to do. And I think that uh, any, I don't know, that's for, uh, for you guys to decide. I'm not going to tell you what that is. And, and I guess the part of that conversation, Troy, or just, I think would be, if this is the last piece of property like that in the city, that's one issue. If this is one of, you know, and there's seven more, and I don't know that, I don't think there are, but we ought to think through that a little bit. You guys ought to think through that a little bit. Well, there's there's one other thing I think to consider though too, which is, is is there an option? I think what you're saying is that this is this will be done, but for us to make an assessment of what needs to be done or what could possibly need to be done, because here's the other thing is, it's also it's it's opportunistic maybe to claim this as private property for decades and then if it's on the verge of having some serious upkeep done then turning it over to the city at that point that's that's where i would feel like the city does not necessarily have a moral obligation to to step in if it's a timeliness issue in terms of yeah of us taking of us paying the bill for something that's come and due and that's why ben's assessment is so great yeah okay so I'll have uh, maybe at our next meeting, we also have Dave Coke come or he sends an email or something, but we've done that work. We don't believe that that's the case. Okay. Um, I agree with you. I also think that it's while it, you know, I just told you that Sessions was a precedent. It certainly was for water sewer. There is no other condition like this in the city. Even Jeffrey place isn't wide enough to have curbs and sidewalks. It's not wide enough to really present and connect to the rest of the city. So this is an outlier when it comes to the street. Okay. Well, we will look forward to someone coming and speaking about that uh, in October. With your permission, we will move on to tabled ordinances. I believe that um, I know that the ones about aggregation, Richard had suggested to me that he would like to take off the table and discuss um, information about the survey, but the mayor has already done that. So we're going to leave those on the table. But I know that Jessica um, has uh, some action on resolution 1021. Yes, um, I would like to take resolution 1021. Not off the table yet, right? We want to talk about decision first. No, off the table. Okay, so let's, I'm going to make a motion to move that off the table. Okay, second. is there a second? second. Mr. Klingler, second. <laughs> All those in favor, of voice vote, please. Aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Wait, did Ms. Rathers vote? She voices our supplier. <laughs> She's working on it. Giggling while I said aye. <laughs> All right. Jessica? Yes. Yeah, so last week, um, City Council met um, in a quasi for a quasi judicial hearing on um, this resolution 10 21. Um, regarding the a variance, a pr proposed variance for 407 Northview. Um, thank you for those in attendance tonight being here. And thank you for waiting um, as we've concluded other city business and for being very patient. We know your lives are busy and uh, we appreciate you being here tonight. So we had the opportunity to do that last week. Um, and we were all presented with the decision that council um, had made last week at that quasi judicial hearing. Um, so right now I am going to just speak to all of you about the decision um, before we actually get back to this resolution. And um, with that being said, everybody was copied on it from our city attorney, our city zoning attorney. And um, so you should have had the opportunity to look at that 
it was circulated. So at this time, I'm just going to ask if there are any comments or discussions on that. And I'm going to start there because um, the next step we would take is to go um, to move, just so you guys know how this works. Um, we would go to the then um, ask to have the resolution 1021 bought off the table and make amendments to that resolution. So we'll start with the decision tonight. Um, any comments or questions regarding that? I know everyone had a chance to read it. It was very thorough. Okay. So no questions. All right. So then we would, I believe, do we take a vote on that, Mark, to approve that decision before we go to the resolution? Yeah, I think that's mm -hmm. the right thing to do. Okay. To okay. Because of now I understand that the decision is not pub made public until we actually vote on it. And then that decision would be made public as far as our facts and findings from that quasi judicial hearing. Right. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> Trying to put Monique Lamke's hat on here and Mr. <laughs> Fischel's and Mrs. Cunningham's. Okay. So, with that being said, I'll um, would like to make a motion to approve the decision um, from uh, resolution 1021. Second. Okay. There's a first, but there's a. I'm sorry. I, I, what, what I would suggest is that you may the motion say that the to approve the decision granting the variance request with conditions. Okay. That way, again, it's clear what the motion is, even though it'll be clear when everybody reads this as well. Okay. So, so I would like to make a, mo a motion on the decision granting the proposed variance for resolution 10-21 um, with conditions. Second. That's Perfect. <laughs> any questions from council on that? Any counts, any questions from um, those in attendance? Uh, Mr. Auditor? Mr. Klingler? Yes. Ms. Saad? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Ms. Feibel? Yes. Mr. Markham? Yes. Ms. Lamke? Yes. All right. Thank you, Council. So with that being said, what we'll move to now is I will would like to make a motion to take resolution 1021 off the table. You've already done I that. I think we've already, already done that. that. So now You're I'm just going to open it, it for discussion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, at this time, we can make amendments to the resolution. Does everyone have a copy and everyone was able to see the amended resolution 10-21? Um, you want me to put that on the screen? That would be great. Yeah. That's the advantage of incumbency, right? <laughs> okay. So um, basically what this amended resolution is doing is it's offering via the decision that council spoke on that um, the facts and finding, findings and, and conclusions of the application, we did find met the standards for the variance that the proposed variance that they were looking for. But council did recommend that with that proposed variance being approved, that there were conditions um, that would apply to the variance. So that's the part um, in C of amended resolution 10-21. I'm gonna read out to council right now to make sure everybody feels comfortable with, um, with these conditions that uh, were discussed in the decision-making process last Tuesday. I love it. And that was just recommended that after I, I um, go over these conditions, I would love to hear from the property owners on if you're comfortable with those or um, comment that you have, okay? So the variance is granted in this resolution to allow for division of the property and separate residential development of lot 19 and lot 20 are all subject to the following conditions. No lot split can occur during the existing structures on lot 19 and lot 20 have been, um, have been demolished. A separate landscape plan for each lot must be reviewed and approved by Bexley Tree and Public Gardens Commission or the city's landscape consultant before any lot split. No tree or shrubs shall be removed from the property before any demolition or the approval of a landscape plan for each lot without prior approval of the Bexley Tree and Public Gardens Commission or the city's landscape consultant. The owner shall prepare and file with the 
BZAP, uh, Board of Zoning and Planning, an application for a subdivision without a plat as provided and required by Bexley ordinances, including Bexley City Code Section 1236-11. Any such subdivision shall be subject to the conditions of the variance. All other provisions of the Bexley City Code shall apply, including, but not limited to, um, and you'll see each one of those codes there, including um, the other code as well. So um, I'm gonna go ahead with that. Ms. Saad, can I real quickly expound on that just slightly? Yes. So items number two and three are already required by our code. Mm -hmm. The sections of code that are cited include the one that requires um, landscape plan and um, for demolition. It also requires that no tree or shrub be removed uh, prior to demolition. So those are covered. Um, and it's, yeah, it's reiterating, which is good. Right. So by putting those in there, we were just yep. wanting to make it more transparent. And um, since we're not all attorneys and we may not be all familiar with all the codes, yep. then uh, just reiterating that. Do, do you have questions or comments for us? If you do, if you want to come up and state your name and your address, that would be great. Hi, uh, Kristen Rosen, and I'm here on behalf of the applicant. The applicant is here as well. It was my pleasure to be before you last Tuesday, and then also we were before BZAP last Thursday. BZAP also granted the um, lot split, which I believe is number four on the variance conditions, with conditions which are substantially similar to what you've proposed. Mm -hmm. So it's clear to me that everybody's on the same page, which is great. One of the two questions that we have, paragraph two, um, C2 would require a landscape plan for lot number 19, I'm sorry, lot number 20, which um, right now is planned to be a vacant lot. The home is going to be constructed on lot number 19. So not sure what the wisdom of providing a landscape plan for a vacant lot, presumably when, when everything is completed, the home is built on lot number 19, um, a new buyer would come and, and make proposals to the city on, um, you know, what is intended to be built there and a landscape plan would, in theory, be um, as part of that proposal. Um, it would seem to me that you would want the lot split in place, lot split in place when you're marketing lot number um, 20 for sale. And so um, I, I guess that, that there's a question there as to whether or not we need to have the landscape plan before um, we identify, you know, the, the, how the, how the house is going to situate on that particular lot. And then the second question that we have is in paragraph number three, the applicant has already received um, approval for demolition. What we don't know is whether or not landscape has been part of that process already. And that's just because we don't know, um, you know, whether or not that's occurred. Certainly we're happy to, to work with the um, um, the landscape board, or the Bexley Tree and Public Gardens Commission when selecting trees for removal, whatever, but we think that may have been already done as part of the approvals to get the existing demolition approvals. I can answer the first um, and what council, how they came to that decision and some concerns was since they would be two separate lots mm -hmm. and one would be up for sale, um, council was just concerned with being neighborly in the community that there would simply just be grass that would be there. And so that it wouldn't be a, a deterrent and just a lot that was not uh, taken care of and demo was done. And then it wasn't kind of brought back to just a simple beautification of making sure that grass was simply there. So that's where council was coming from on that. Then maybe it just a maintain the long care according the city code, oh. but not to plan the new new trees and no new design landscaping those kind of things you know what I mean mm -hmm. because this is an empty lot. So I can address this because we have past precedent with this. Yeah. So we do require landscape plans for demolition even if it's an a, a interim use. So an example of that is a lot of Cassingham in Maine has recently been demolished. It was a former commercial property. A landscape plan was required just to show. Even if it's simple as we're filling, it's compacting, we're putting a grass in, ensuring that 
trees and shrubs are preserved. So those are existing sections of our city code that require that. I did speak with the attorney a little bit about this when I saw this. I just want to double check that she had intended that in writing it as well. And, it, and the intent is that it matches our code, which is not to do a landscape plan for a new home. It's to do a landscape plan for that interim use. And it doesn't, it doesn't specify anything other than just landscape plan. But if it's as simple as a lawn, that's okay? <clears throat> yeah, because even that plan would show that this tree exists, this tree exists, this tree exists. They're oh, not being okay. taken away, right? Uh, that's Kathy already indicated. Yes. My architect will address that. Yeah. Which and then it's going to be removed. Which one is not going to remove. So that's, yes. Great. Uh, architect of will, you know. Which ties in directly with the next point, which sure. is that sure. in 1026.16, we have pretty specific provisions for non-removal um, and approval of a landscape plan prior to the demolition taking place. So there is there is some additional work that needs to be done, even if BZAP might not even been aware necessarily of that section of the code, just in terms of that process. So just be careful that you're looking at that section. Yep. Any other comments? No. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck with your building. Yes. Right. <laughs> We're you. ready to see something really beautiful there. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, um, so we need to um, vote on amending. So, and then vote on the actual thing. So go ahead. Right. So I would like to make um, a motion to vote on amendment, uh, a resolution 10 dash, amended resolution 10 dash 21. First, we're voting on the amendments themselves. Second. So Oh, and sorry. Ms. Robinson seconded sorry. that. Yes, All wonderful. right. Are there any questions on the amendments to this ordinance? Wait, I'm not sure what the motion was. The motion was to amend, yes. not on the amended version, right? So we're amending now. We're amending, okay. right? Yes. All right. No questions? No questions from those in attendance? Right. Ms. Seibel? Yes. Mr. Markham? Yes. Ms. Lamke? Yes. Mr. Klingler? Yes. Ms. Saad? Yes. Ms. Robinson? Yes. Asked. Now, do you have action on amended ordinance uh, 1021? Yes, I would like to um, make a motion to um, on take action on the amended to approve, to approve <laughs> the amended resolution 10-21. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Lamke. Mr. Auditor. Ms. Saad. Yes. Ms. Robinson. Yes. Mr. Markham. Ms. Yes. Mr. Klingler. Yes. Ms. Feibel. Yes. Ms. Lamke. Yes. Passed. Wonderful. Thank all right. You. Okay, Thank you're you all set. Thank you so much. <laughs> Good luck with everything. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we're gonna move on to um, our reports. Uh, Finance Committee, Mr. Markham, Chair. No, I don't think so. All right. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> I he, I had he was there. really busy for the first hour from five to six. Okay. Uh, safety and health committee, Ms. Robinson. This kind of information is really important to help kind of formulate what that policy will look like. So I encourage everybody to uh, take a few minutes and answer that survey and uh, do some service for our uh, city. So that's it. Other than that, I have nothing. Thanks, Jen. We will make a point of that and we will make sure that we share it with all of our neighbors and friends, et cetera. Zoning and Development Committee, Jessica Saad, Chair. Yes, um, just real quickly, I was gonna um, report on the CIC meeting that we had last week. Um, please make note that the next one is actually going to be on election night, November 2nd. <laughs> um, busy night, five o'clock here in City Hall. We're getting started early, so write that down. Um, we did hear from Nicole Boyer of TCB um, with a resubmission of Livingston and the Cassidy project. Um, as, as of this time, no partnership is um, expected to happen with the CIC because of the, hit, the no history of um, building housing. So they're looking at prospective partnerships. 
Um, so I'm sure we'll hear more at the November meeting. And then the mayor spoke about 420 North Cassidy, which is super exciting um, to, uh, to do something with that space currently. And I love that it's gonna be a senior slash teen um, space. I think the community is gonna really respond to that. So I love the creative thinking. Um, and then quickly here, I have a note from Pam Glasgow from the BEF of what she wanted to report tonight. So um, she wanted to make sure everybody knew that um, the Bexley Education Foundation has initiated this year's annual fund drive. They are planning to publish their fall alumni magazine in October. And they're taking a big initiative on making sure that alumni are more um, uh, doing just a better job of engaging young alumni as well as old alumni back into the community and uh, really using you know, the um, futuristic databases to be able to, to grab a hold of those alumni. So it's, it's pretty cool what they're doing there. They are planning for a new and improved Bravo, save the date, March 26, 2022 is what they're planning. Um, and they have undertaken a rebranding initiative. And the first step is a community-wide survey, which anyone can take. Um, there's a QR code that I'll copy everyone sitting here tonight on. So um, I would love for everybody to participate in that. Um, the Education Foundation, as we know, does a lot for extra for our schools and uh, allows us to have the top education that we expect in Bexley schools. So that is my report. Thank you, Jessica. Yes. Moving on to Recreation and Parks Committee, Mr. Klingler. Nothing to report. Thank you, Mr. Klingler. Judiciary and Strategic Committee, Monique Lamke. Uh, two things. First of all, I know that most of you attended the very successful Taste of Bexley. I think that our Bexley Area Chamber of Commerce really hit it out of the park. What we thought maybe was going to be uh, ruined by some weather ended up being a wonderful night in Bexley. So thanks to all of you for volunteering. Thanks to the chamber and also thanks to the vendors and businesses and sponsors that uh, took place to that. Um, the second was just a reminder, October 8th, uh, Hispanic Heritage Food Truck Celebration in the parking lot of the Bexley Library. Come and have a great time. Um, and just also a very quick thank you again to the Community Foundation for their generous grant to uh, see what's possible with uh, the property up on North Cassidy for our seniors. So I applaud them um, so much for doing that. End of report. Madam President, I was also corrected by Mike Price. I was so enthusiastic. It was a $30,000 grant, not a $40,000 grant. So I just set the record straight. Mm. So you don't get mad 30, later on in the 40, BC. Yeah. You know, what's, what's 10,000 between friends? <laughs> Maybe they'll forget. <laughs> All right. Um, the end of our committee uh, reports and we are to the point of public comments towards the end of our meeting. Is there anyone um, that has any comments to share with us this evening? All right, is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Thank you, is there a second? Second. Thank you, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Um, those opposed, same sign. All right, meeting is adjourned at 7.33 and 26 seconds. I get to go see Nick play soccer.